So the first would be that this event is being streamed uh, on, on, uh, via YouTube. So if you prefer your, like, your likeness to not be recorded, we'd suggest just turning off your, your camera. Um, we also uh, are inviting um, uh, our participants to, to pose any questions they might have in the chat box. My colleague Brock Amadian will be uh, collecting and collating the questions. We're hoping at the end, end of the event to have uh, maybe five or 10 minutes for a Q&A and or to uh, uh, pose these questions throughout the, the Q&A. So if you have anything uh, you want more answers on, please, uh, please let us know in the chat box. And uh, for the event, we opted for um, uh, a meeting view in Zoom uh, as opposed to a webinar Zoom uh, uh, format so that we could see everyone. Uh, you know, they're, it's kind of more like a, like a live event, I suppose. Uh, but that being said, could we ask everyone to just ensure that you're muted throughout the event? And uh, once again, uh, any questions can be uh, posed via the chat box. So uh, without further delay, uh, we're going to jump right into the, the questions. Um, and Ken, I might pose this first one to you, if you'd be so inclined. Um, so in, in the last few years, uh, the international community has been buying and selling uh, more weapons uh, than at any point since the, the Cold War. Um, how does Canada fit into this? Right. Canada is, uh, you know, deemed a kind of middle power in the international stage. Um, are we a major arms exporter today and historically, and who are we selling weapons to? Well, Canada historically is, is not in the first tier of um, arms exporters, but certainly is a significant arms exporter. Um, the first tier is primarily or essentially the um, permanent members of the UN Security Council. Uh, the US is perennially top of the list, followed uh, in varying order by France, the UK, Russia, and to a lesser extent, China. Uh, and then Canada falls in, as I said, into kind of the second tier, along with a number of European countries uh, and, and increasingly others outside of Europe. Um, that said, uh, there's at least two reasons why Canadian military exports tend to be underreported. The first is um, because most Canadian military production is in the form of um, subcomponents or parts that many um, monitors of the arms trade don't, uh, don't follow closely. And an example is the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which tends to monitor just major weapon systems. And, and the second, uh, and probably in many ways more important uh, reason why Canada's arms trade is underreported is because um, the, the, the relationship between the US and Canada in terms of arms exporting is um, not documented for the large, large part. Um, there's a special arrangement that essentially allows a free flow of goods across the border, and that tends not to be monitored by external monitors. Thank you, Ken. Um, that's, that's a good overview. Um, I, I, would, I would say also, too, in, in recent years, um, if you were walking down Main Street, perhaps, and you talk to any average Canadian and, and ask them about the Canadian arms trade, uh, there's one deal in particular that they might bring up. Uh, and this is the 2014 uh, $14 billion arms deal to Saudi Arabia. Um, this deal is, is quite well known uh, by the Canadian public. It's been uh, rather controversial um, and it's gotten a lot of kind of play in the media uh, as well as in parliament. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, you know, is, is this deal, and, and Anthony, I might uh, throw this one to you, but is this deal unprecedented? Um, have we seen a deal of this value before? Have we sold to Saudi Arabia before? Have we sold to its allies? What does that historical relationship look like? Sorry, I, I had to unmute myself. Um, I think it's a yes and no uh, type of answer to that one. Um, on the one hand, you have an unprecedented value uh, attached to the deal, uh, anywhere between 11 and $14 billion. I mean, the original uh, originally stated uh, number of vehicles uh, went down from over 900 to around, I think it's 742 is the, the current number we, as we understand it. Uh, Whereas you know the number of vehicles in the in the original uh, 
deal in 1993 it was over a thousand vehicles that they sold but the value was probably lower accounting for inflation and uh, time and whatnot um but i think uh, one thing that might be um unpre unprecedented in terms of the scope of the deal uh and so, someone like ken could perhaps correct me or yourself is the uh the recipient um it was reported originally and for years uh that the saudi arabian national guard was the recipient uh, of these vehicles uh, and only recently uh, in part thanks to a court case in belgium where belgian activists were trying to do what daniel turk was trying to do in canada and legally uh, get an injunction to stop the, the export of the turrets and cannons that are shipped to uh, to, to saudi arabia via canada um, where the courts rejected it ultimately on grounds of uh, the fact that uh, these are these are intended for the Saudi Royal Guard, which is a, uh, basically devoted or tasked with protecting the House of Saud, um, and uh, not the National Guard. So on, on those on those grounds, they said, uh, therefore, there's there's less of a risk of them being uh, used in Yemen or deployed in Yemen in the war that's been going on since 2015. Uh, therefore, on those grounds, we're going to reject that. Uh, uh, request to to uh, end the, the export permits. Um, and so, yeah, the number of vehicles is a little bit lower than it's been historically. Uh, people should know that the the very first export permits that were approved for light armor vehicles, they called them the AVGP program at the time, the 19, uh, was developed out of the 1970s, uh, were uh, in 1981 for 400 vehicles. Um, that evolved over time and, and increased the overall number as that as that deal finally closed and then uh, the the vehicles started shipping in the 1990s so it's a bit of a mixed bag you have uh, as i said yeah, yes and no in many ways uh, there are other unprecedented aspects of it and also should mention you know we probably know uh we don't know more about all the details of the contract and uh, you know where that's where the devil resides uh than we actually do know so uh, there's a lot of open questions still seven years after you know, almost to the date since this was first announced Yes, those known unknowns, and that's kind of a recurring thing that we have to deal with, right? Um, so that that program going back to the 1980s, those LAVs were produced at the same location, uh, General Dynamics Land Systems Canada, or if it was uh, General uh, Motors at the time, yeah, or I guess it would more. have been beforehand, yeah. So that's the same, they're, they're based, you know, that's the LAV3, the LAV3, it's the same platform from London, Ontario? Uh, yes, essentially, yeah. All right, so when we bring up uh, Yemen and we bring up Saudi Arabia and we take kind of a, you know, we cast a critical gaze on these arms exports. Um, so, I mean, what's the problem with arming Saudi Arabia, right? Um, and it, it might be a, an obvious answer to some, but, you know, what threats do these weapons pose? Uh, you know, have they appeared in conflicts? You mentioned Yemen. Have they appeared in Yemen? How do we know that? And, and what's the issue with that? Uh, yeah, the, uh, in terms of Yemen, uh, well, the, the labs have been under production since 2014, this under this big contract. And we should also mention there's, there's other uh, coinciding lab contracts at the same time that have been continued to be fulfilled. Um, so the data, for example, which shows approximately $5.5 billion worth that have been exported since 2017. Uh, may include uh, other models of labs under e earlier contracts, such as with the, uh, the U.S., what's called the FMS, the Foreign Military Sales Umbrella. Um, one of the other unique aspects of the deal is that uh, they were, they've been kind of essentially cut out of this, this particular deal, and it's a direct deal between the Canadian Commercial Corporation, an arm of the Canadian government, uh, and the Saudi, the Saudi government sort of acting as a broker between the Saudi government and uh, General Dynamics Canada. Um, but yeah, we've seen the older model labs, uh, and, and it's also another thing to, important to mention uh, in the in the memos that were released in 2016, thanks to Daniel Turp's efforts, uh, the, where we saw uh, the discussions and, and the analysis leading to the positive uh, green lighting of the export permits by Stefan Dion, the Ford Minister at the time. Uh, we we learned that uh, part of the contract is uh, devoted to upgrading older model labs. Uh, not a lot of detail has emerged about this and not a lot of reportage uh, has gone into it. But when you see the overall value, you say you take 742 uh, vehicles and divide it by the value, it seems like a, an awfully high uh, dollar value per unit. So there's got to be some other aspects to this contract that we're not privy to. And uh, I suspect that, you know, some major, some considerable work was put into the older model labs. And the reason I mention that is, it, is, is because it's these older model labs are the ones that we've seen uh, deployed in or around uh, the Yemen conflict. Uh, numerous videos um, 
have, have trickled out here and there by either either taken by the Saudis themselves, kind of celebrating what a, what a great job they're doing, uh, repelling uh, Yemen, the Yemeni hordes, uh, or, or uh, by Yemeni forces who, who've taken ample video footage of, of light armored vehicles uh, that they've destroyed in battles. Uh, so, uh, and in addition to that, there are other there are other weapons of Canadian origin that we've seen, such as the PGW sniper rifles. Um, we saw a real uptick in those from 2015, an export of those from 2015 to 2017. And um, and of course, behind the scenes, you have a number of Canadian other other Canadian players who are who are uh, who've moved into the into the region and set up service centers. You know, so the the Pratt and Whitney uh, Canada made uh, engines that are, are, are littered throughout the uh, the conflict, but also you know the region generally. Um, they need they need uh, technicians in the area to, to service these these aircraft and these engines. Um, the L3 West Cams, who also set up the service centers, and uh, uh, there's almost a niche. In fact, just today there was a big contract announced uh, the purchase of a, a over a billion dollars worth of uh, Bombardier uh, spy planes via Saab. Uh, and the UAE, um, and that's one of several of these spy planes. You know, there's other Canadian companies such as PAL Aerospace uh, doing uh, providing uh, surveillance planes for the UAE as well. You've got companies like CAE who are who are training the UAE uh, drone pilots. Uh, those drones have been spotted in the Yemen conflict. Uh, these are unarmed drones for now, but and uh, you know the list could go on. And, and uh, but we've seen ample evidence of of a Canadian footprint uh, in or around uh, this, this conflict in Yemen in particular um, by way of, of these, these relationships they've been building with the, the militaries of the GCC over the past uh, several years. And that's a good point to bring up, um, right? It, it's not just the LAVs we're talking about. It's not just full systems, full tanks, you know, exporting thousands, uh, thousands of, of individual sniper rifles. But then also these parts and components, which um, which our colleague Ken brought up earlier, right? Again, it's not just full systems; it's a lot of parts and components. Uh, you mentioned the contract uh, for um, for the Bombardier. Uh, I believe it's a Global Six Thousand that was announced, um, right? Those are Canadian components that are going in. Well, that's 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 a plane, but it's being outfitted with components while over there. And then we see other full systems being outfitted with things like exactly Pratt and Whitney engines or L3 Harris West Cam sensors, and and this this makes it much more difficult to get a, a good idea of exactly what is going on. Um, this leads me into kind of my my next question, and and, and Ken, we might uh, rely on you again here. So all of these companies, uh, and we've just mentioned a bunch, um, they, they manufacture and, and uh, kind of dumb down, but, but sell these weapons abroad, right? Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the Canadian government is the actor that, that really green lights these permits, right? Officials from the Export Control Division of Global Affairs Canada are the final ones to assess uh, the inherent risk associated with, with exporting these, these systems. So Ken, what does that look like? Like in a nutshell, and I know it's not perhaps a, a quick question to answer, but how does, how does the Canadian uh, export control regime work, especially when uh, trying to account for protecting human rights? Well, uh, I think the first thing to recognize is that the, the Canadian government itself, like, like uh, most governments worldwide, recognizes that the arms trade is a special trade. It's not like trade of, uh, you know, of, of uh, ordinary trade. Um, and as a result, uh, it, it needs to be authorized by the Canadian government through export permits. So there, has to, there is an application process that suppliers do have to, to go through in order for the government to authorize uh, the transfer of, of uh, military goods. And um, in recent years, there's basically kind of been two levels of, of how the government has done that. Um, both involve permits, but, but the, the legislation and the regulations behind the system has changed because of the arms trade treaty. Um, formerly, before the treaty, uh, the, the Canadian government system allowed for the minister to basically approve anything at any time. Um, and uh, even though there were guidelines that, that uh, included things like whether or not there was a risk of human rights violation, um, ultimately the minister could override that and approve um, 
uh, any, as I say, basically anything that the Canadian suppliers produced. Um, whereas now under the arms trade treaty, there are, uh, and, and because the Canadian government actually changed the Export and Import Permits Act, which, which regulates the arms transfers, um, in order to, to uh, align with the treaty, there are now stronger requirements of the government, including, um, as has already been mentioned, a formal process of risk assessment. And um, the risk assessment has to take into account as part of the, the, you know, the evaluation of the risk, whether or not uh, there is a substantial risk uh, um, for things like human rights, international uh, violations of international um, humanitarian law, um, and um, whether or not there, there, there's a risk of gender-based uh, violence. Um, and the, the minister is now legally bound, if there is a substantial risk, to not approve uh, the, the transfer of, of military goods. So, and that is a significant change from the past. Um, I'll leave it at that for now, I think. No, thanks, Ken. Um, do, do, have, have we seen up to this point? So, so Canada acceded to, and uh, I, I open this up, up uh, for, the, for the entire crowd. Allison, if you have an answer to this, I, I, would, I would love to hear, but uh, no pressure. Um, so Canada's uh, accession to the arms trade treaty was, was relatively recent. It was in September of 2019. I should mention after, after years of, of lobbying by groups like Plowshares, as well as colleagues of ours, um, and Canada, I think, was the 103rd state's party to, to fully accede to the treaty. Um, and although it's, it's not been a huge amount of time since Canada's acceded to the treaty, have we, do, do we know, have we seen any, any have, have we seen the arms trade treaty actually reduce arms exports or impact the, the trade or transfer of weapons? Do we have any indication that Canada's accession to the treaty has uh, in, in any gainfully way actually led to any rejections of arms exports to those countries that, that might misuse them? Um, I, should I go ahead or? Please, um, please. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Um, you know, to, to be honest, we, we don't have that information yet. And when I was preparing for today, I was taking a look at some of your analysis, Kelsey, and, and some of the others who are on the event as well. And I think that the, the problem is really in the, in the way that Canada reports on its uh, permit denials. You know, there isn't a lot of information given about the reason why a potential arms transfer or a permit is being denied, which is complicating efforts to, to understand how well the arms trade treaty and the, the change in policies are really being implemented practically. No, and, th and that's a good point. And I invite Ken, I just saw you, uh, you went live with your mic though. So please, if you have a follow-up. Well, yeah, um, I, I would just want to point out one specific case, which I, which I think might be the first time where the Canadian government policy might be overtly changed by obligations under the arms trade treaty. I might be wrong on this as well. It might, you know, I might be overly optimistic, but I think as a result of the, uh, the research that you did, Kelsey, around the situation um, in uh, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan and, and Canadian supply of uh, L3 Westcam uh, surveillance systems. Um, the one of the obligations of the treaty is to look at export permits if there's new information that that comes available um, during during the period when the exports are are underway. And we know as a result of of um, Kelsey's work around exposing the, the involvement of L3 in, in that particular conflict, the Canadian government did suspend, uh, or at least they announced they suspended uh, transfers of the L3 systems. Um, and uh, my own view is that, that that is because they were cognizant of, of their obligations under the treaty. What we don't know is what's happened since the, the suspension, whether, you know, whether things have, have restarted, 
there hasn't been any report, at least that I'm aware of, and as to what if there is, is any kind of final outcome of that of that particular uh, situation. But I do think it. I mean, my, in my own view, I think that is because, in part, because of the public attention to it, but in part because of obligations of the treaty. I think that, that change was made. Can maybe just just add two two things to that. I think it's something that Ken said that's really important to keep in mind when thinking about the arms trade treaty is that these risk assessments are need to be made continuously and on a case by case basis. So the situations change and they evolve, which might warrant a different decision than maybe was made in the past. Um, and also to point out that under the arms trade treaty, there are annual reporting requirements for its states parties. When you become a state party, you have to submit an initial report, which kind of presents like a baseline view of, of current practice and current policy. And then every year thereafter, states parties are obligated to report on their imports and exports, um, which I think will also help to, to, to shed some light on, on how impactful the treaty is or is not. No, I agree. I, I think those are all uh, good points. Um, and I, I would comment too, uh, to follow up with you, Ken, on uh, the, the Turkey situation. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons uh, perhaps that the government of Canada did feel the, the pressure to make a move on that uh, was due to the fact that it, it became increasingly clear that the government of Turkey was uh, diverting uh, Canadian weapon systems. And, and I want to bring attention to this because it's a, it's a term that, uh, that we might use uh, but diversion is, um, we would primarily define it as the illicit transfer of a weapon system from the uh, intended recipient uh, uh, to, to an illicit third party. So basically, you know, a consumer of, of Canadian weapons, in, in this instance, Turkey, uh, is then going and turning around and, and selling, or in some cases, giving these weapon systems uh, to its friends. And that's an illicit, uh, that's a, 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 an illicit relationship. That is actually a breach of the arms trade treaty if the um, uh, exporting state uh, fails to, uh, to cease those exports. Um, so uh, moving on, one, one, big, uh, one big policy objective of the current government um, is, uh, as, as far as we understand, actually going to be launched uh, next month. And uh, that is the launch of a, a feminist foreign policy. Um, and I'm just curious, and Allison, this is this is going uh, to you due to your expertise on the issue. Um, the idea that Canada can espouse a feminist foreign policy while um, exporting weapons to one of the most repress repressive regimes in the world has been problematized. Um, are, are, are these two things that that Canada can do at once, uh, arming Saudi Arabia while also espousing a feminist foreign policy? Yeah, good question. And uh, thank you for raising this dimension of the issue. I think it's one of those dimensions that if we don't make a point to include sometimes gets overlooked and, and swept under the carpet a little bit. Um, my short answer is that no, the, the two are completely incompatible, um, but I'm happy to, to kind of explain a little bit more about that. Um, so just some quick background, uh, for a few years now, the Canadian government has been saying that it has a feminist foreign policy it hasn't um, thoroughly outlined what that means practically, what are the underlying principles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but over the last several months, Global Affairs Canada has been working toward launching its FFP, it's the acronym, in a more official way. We hope this will be coming in March. Um, and one of the things that WILPS and other organizations as well have been underscoring is this fundamental incompatibility between, um, between having a feminist foreign policy and the ongoing transfer of arms, and in particular, the Canada-Saudi deal. Um, I, think, I think there are some obvious reasons if, if you look at the concerns about gender-based violence that are already written into the arms trade treaty and that are now also written into Canadian arms export law. Um, I think that those are sort of the, the, the quick and obvious reasons that people can understand when they see that these two are not compatible. Um, but I would also really invite, you know, the audience and anyone listening to see that a feminist foreign policy is about going beyond lifting up or focusing on concern about women's rights and gender equality. 
in and of itself. Like that's a very com important component of it, but it's, it's broader and it's actually better understood as applying a feminist lens to all matters of foreign policy or international affairs. If you want to have a foreign policy that is guided by feminist principles and gender analysis, it's going to mean questioning and understanding the root causes of violence, oppression, inequality, and conflict. It's gonna require taking a step back from traditional foreign policy thinking and refocusing away from some of the familiar tools and levers of foreign policy like military force, violence, and domination. So herein is the conundrum that you pointed to in your question, how can the Canadian government or really any government promote a feminist foreign policy as I've just described it with one hand, uh, but simultaneously continue to provide tools of violence and repression with the other hand and profit from it. It just, it just doesn't line up. And that, that, was, that was a great summary, Alison. Uh, thank you. Um, so looking at, um, and, and I should mention too, as Ken said, I mean, uh, you know, uh, considering the threat of gender-based violence is, is also now, um, uh, baked into Canadian law uh, following the, the, the passing of Bill C-47 uh, prior to the accession of, um, of uh, Canada's accession to the Arms Trade Treaty, um, which obviously has some, some very strong connections to espousing to have a, a, a feminist foreign policy. Um, so when, when we're looking at Canada's export control regime, um, any, anyone that's, that's really um, you know, sat down and read through this, uh, on paper, I mean, Canada does have a pretty strong uh, regulatory regime, um, and certainly much stronger than actually many of our allies or many of, of our of our peers. Um, so, if if that is the case, uh, then how do these problematic arms deals? I don't know, slip through the through the cracks, right? Uh, we know that there is inherent risks with arming countries like Saudi Arabia. Uh, we know that Saudi Arabia uh, frequently um, is, is is alleged to to violate international humanitarian law in Yemen. And we know that they do it frequently with Western weapons. And we know that we have images of Canadian weapons in that conflict zone. So if, if Canada collectively has what appears to be a strong regulatory arms control regime, um, how do we arm Saudi Arabia? You know, how did we find our, ourselves in this spot? And I would uh, ask, ask anyone to, uh, to, to address that. Uh, I'll, I'll make a start. Um, one of the issues, of course, is that um, Canada itself uh, wants to uh, supply its own Department of National Defense and, and it um, builds or orders systems to do that. Um, during the Second World War, a lot of those systems were um, produced by Crown corporations. Um, that were owned by the government and that were part of the supply of, of, the, of the needs of the war. Um, and then when we went into the Cold War, of course, there was additional reasons to, to uh, keep some of them at least. Um, um, eventually, virtually all of them were, were uh, privatized, um, the, some of the last ones under the Mulroney government. Um, and then they, you know, then they move into the realm of commercial uh, ventures that um, have their own kind of uh, momentum around uh, often under the, um, the guise of, of, of job production or, or the, the saving of jobs, which is, of course, the excuse we've heard often around the, the Saudi deal. Um, so, you know, the, the, the issue becomes um, uh, as long as we're producing uh, these kinds of systems, then, then there will be jobs dependent on them. And uh, because the Canadian government itself is not a large enough market to keep uh, those jobs and, and production systems going, there's a very strong argument for, for exports. Um, and it, I mean, this is common to all suppliers, uh, even the US now. Um, uh, one of the things I think we can be confident of is when, whenever Trump was talking about the Europeans, uh, you know, not spending enough on the military, uh, 
one of the main, main reasons for that was because he wanted to get American export orders to, to Europe. I mean, that, that, that was what driving a lot of that. And so, I mean, this is a common problem. And it, 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 and it needs attention. I mean, it, it needs the Canadian government to recognize that there shouldn't be job dependency on uh, systems that, are, that, that go to countries like Saudi Arabia and, and, and create high risks of human rights violations and, and other problems. Um, we need to have a process where, although there can be reasons why Canadian forces need armored vehicles, for example, peacekeeping missions, um, but that once those those uh, production uh, needs are met for the Canadian government, there, there's there's some kind of wind down or some kind of different process that uh, steps away from export dependency. I'll just add one thing uh, to keep in mind with respect to, again going back to Saudi Arabia, again with the original justification that they used to, to kind of open up the possibility of, of a flow of Canadian arms exports to Saudi Arabia. Because once upon a time, uh, the regulations, export permit regulations were much stricter. Uh, up until Pierre Trudeau visited in 1980, and very shortly thereafter, when the first LAV uh, export permits were approved in 1981. But the discussions internally at the time were very clear. You know, if uh, if Canada wants access to the broader uh, commercial uh, possibilities and potentials inside the kingdom, uh, we have to be willing to also sell them def defense equipment. Um, and so it's very straightforward. You know, we're we're also uh, an importer of their oil. Uh, but Trudeau back in 1980 basically made a commitment. He said, you know, we we're we're open to more deepening our relationship with you know the Canada Saudi relationship, and. Uh, we recognize that if we want our piece of the pie uh, in terms of you know the, the access to the petrodollars, access to uh, engineering and consulting contracts, et cetera, across the board, if we want to bring Saudi students in, if we want them to buy our wheat, we got to sell them weapons. And also sometimes these calculations are that cold or calculated. Uh, and it's, it's explicit in, in the archival records that I've gone through uh, in terms of the point of origin. And I think you bring up some really interesting uh, points, Anthony. I think this speaks to, to your work more broadly as well, right? Um, th this doesn't come down merely to, uh, you know, a dollar value. Uh, there is much broader and deeper political calculations that are going into uh, to arming certain regimes, right? And it's, it's again, it's not just about uh, the value of the sales. Um, and I want to echo something that, that Ken brought up as well. Right, we we consistently hear that. Um, well, if the Saudi arms deal uh, was cancelled, uh, we would lose a couple thousand jobs alone in Ontario, which of course would be terrible. Um, and that's the last thing that we want to hear as a human rights organization. You know, access to, to good work is a human right. Um, however, if 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 the if the government of Canada continues to pursue deals that um, run the risk of having to be cancelled because they are facilitating human rights abuses, that would be, in my opinion, totally financially irresponsible, right? I mean, how much more irresponsible could you, could you get to have a $14 billion deal resting on the fact that hopefully the recipient doesn't violate human rights when it does all the time? Um, so this is kind of something that we're, we're, we're actually always getting posed. Um, a lot of times if we're talking to media, we'll be asked, well, what about the jobs? And it's something that we do think uh, really critically about. Um, however, you know, this dependency on, on, on um, very problematic arms exports uh, is a continuing issue which, which should be problematized. Um, uh, another question kind of dealing with the economics here. So uh, again, you know, we, we frequently get the question, okay, well, if, if these arms sales are so bad, uh, why does the government of Canada, um, you know, take part in them? And, and frequently the answer is, is economics, but it kind of in, in uh, and we're not looking for precise values, but in the greater, broader scheme of things, right? How big is the sector or the, the section of the Canadian economy that goes to the arms trade, right? I mean, if we're, if we're looking at the slice of the pie, how big is it? 
and um, you know how much money is actually coming into Canada from, in particular, this 2014 Saudi arms deal. And again, I'd, I'd invite anyone to uh, to address. Um, I can take again an initial crack at that. The um, uh, the answer is nobody knows. Um, uh, now that said, we can we can estimate that we are talking about multiple billions of dollars per year, certainly currently because of the Saudi deal. But even even over the last several decades, um, sales to the U.S. alone, um, Project Plowshares is estimated between two and three billion dollars a year on average. Um, uh, and it has, because of the Saudi deal in recent years, you know, basically doubled that. I mean, it, one of the things that's interesting is that I, I'm, I'm fairly confident to say that in 2019, we saw for the first time, maybe ever, um, Saudi Arabia surpassed the U.S. as Canada's largest um, uh, arms importer. Uh, and uh, up until then, it was the U.S. out, out front. Uh, I mean, in some years, uh, it was more than 75% uh, of Canadian military goods was going to the U.S. So, I mean, the U.S. has always been a major customer. So it is significant that in recent years, the Saudis have bested that, if you like. Um, but because the U.S. has been such a dominant importer and because there's no way of knowing the volume of sales there, we literally don't know what the annual value of Canadian military exports is. Um, but as I say, we can say with some confidence it's multi-billions, um, and so it's not insignificant. One of the other points I would want to make in, the, in this context is that um, while the, the, that, you know, we cannot shake off that as, as an insignificant part of Canadian uh, you know, uh, general trade, um, because of the nature of the Canadian industry, um, which is almost invariably a mixture of, of um, commercial and military production in, in all the plants. I and mean, the, the, the GM, or sorry, the General Dynamics plant in London is, is a bit of an outlier on this. Um, but um, most uh, companies producing military goods in Canada also produce commercial goods. Um, so while, you know, there is a significant amount of trade that is in the form of military goods, the capacity is there to switch over. Um, and, uh, and that's, again, a thing that, that, you know, should get a lot more attention than, than it has. I'll just uh, add one thing on that. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the lab deal, what one of the in terms of like what we we don't know you know like they've gone out of their way to be ultra secretive about for example the specific uh companies they, so they said when the when the, the deal was announced in 2014 they're like well 500 canadian companies are going to be in the subcontractor supply chain uh, across canada but they wouldn't name any of the companies and there are some uh, emails that you know, emerged through access to information requests and you can see there they, they would rewrite press releases to avoid reference to Saudi Arabia when discussing Canadian companies that may have been getting contracts uh, or just omitting the the press conferences altogether that would have would have uh, drawn attention to this so it's um, but it's interesting because you know that's a 500 company there are approximately 500 companies across Canada and then on top of that I'm sure there's another uh, several hundred that represent the Canadian defense industry under the uh, the industry umbrella, CADSEs, the industry association, busy as we speak in uh, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates uh, at the Canada Pavilion that they've set up there for the, the, the biannual, biannual uh, arms bazaar that's going on as, as we speak today. Um, Kelsey, I also wanted to just go back to, to your earlier question or comments about um, about the human rights risk assessment and the human rights situation. And I think it, it's, it is noteworthy that Canada is very vocal about the human rights situation within, human, within Saudi Arabia. Um, and they've gone on record in a number of ways. There have been diplomatic spats back and forth. So I think it's, it's a very strange sort of um, policy incoherence to, to be so vocal in some ways, yet still emboldening their aggression and their militarism on the other hand. Um, and then I just also listening to Ken right now is talking about how um, Saudi Arabia has overtaken the United States as, as our, our major trade partner. Um, I do think that there is still 
you know, the, the labs and the Saudi deal have gotten a lot of tension and they that's that's important and that's good. But I think it is also good to not lose sight of the sort of black box of, of what's going to the US and also some of the different loopholes within that and how, for example, Canadian engines end up in US warplanes that are then used by Nigeria, for example, where we know there is a bad record of aerial bombardments on schools and on refugee camps. So I think, you know, trying to follow the thread as much as we can is, is important. No, and that's an excellent point too. Um, and I mean, the, um, the kind of thick knot of loopholes um, facing Canadian military exports to the US continue, um, even though Canada has acceded to the arms trade treaty, which is very clear that its implementation has to be universal, but we see a sort of um, favoritism uh, perhaps uh, applied to the US. Um, so that's a very, very germane point to bring up. Um, and also on your first point, yes, I mean, we see Global Affairs Canada will actually come out and very harshly criticize uh, in, in the, in, regarding Saudi Arabia, will, will harshly criticize their human rights record. Uh, in fact, in the um, April 2020 final report, um, which was Global Affairs Canada's kind of final justification for the 2014 uh, $14 billion arms deal, there was actually a series of paragraphs that in, in, in grotesque detail actually went through Saudi human rights violations but ironically, that same document found that Canadian weapons would, uh, you know, face no substantial risk to facilitate such uh, such abuses. So we do kind of see the Canadian government arguing against itself and arguing for itself at the same time. And this is an ongoing uh, issue, right? We have Canada as the dealer of weapons, and then also Canada professing to be uh, the protector of human rights. Um, no, great, great points to bring up. I'm going to bring uh, uh, to everyone's attention that uh, we're, we, we only have about 15 minutes left, uh, which, which I find shocking. Um, so I, I think uh, we're going to pose maybe one or two more questions. And then we have uh, a series of excellent questions from uh, our guests. I can see that the chat has been hot. So um, I'll launch into our final questions and then we'll address some from uh, our participants. So. Um, Tracking the arms trade and anyone that's that has done it, and I mean this is a, a, an ongoing uh, topic that we brought up, is is difficult, right? Um, we do get a lot of good data from the government of Canada, but we also have a lot of lapses in data. Uh, we have inconsistencies in values, um, and and a little bit of um, of uh, you know, well, to be frank, some stonewalling in in, in some in some aspects of it. Um, so. What are some, some new ways that we've seen uh, researchers today uh, track military exports? And I'm kind of thinking of, of what some people call OSINT, but there was kind of this burgeoning field of, of online researchers uh, where we used to have to rely on obscure journals and government data to know that a weapon system was being used in a conflict. But more and more frequently, we're, we're learning about this because we see videos of them posted on YouTube or that sort of thing. So if anyone has any thoughts on that. I'll take a little crack, I guess. Um, yeah, clear, clearly, uh, you said it right there. I mean, uh, one of the, king, the, the key things I've tried to be is uh, adaptable. You know, they're, they're constantly moving the goalposts in terms of, um, you know, two years ago, uh, you would see Saudi Arabian um, uh, divisions of their security apparatus posting what I would call, you know, selfies with their, with their Canadian equipment that got them into a lot of trouble with the Teradyne armored vehicles in 2017 when they launched an operation into the Eastern province in Awamiya. And uh, they ended up, you know, Canadian government launched investigations, uh, stalled those export permits briefly. Uh, but that was all because of uh, residents inside the, those neighborhoods in, in the Eastern province. And then the Saudi forces themselves posting these, you know, they're proud to show what, what, a, what a great job they did, you know, cleansing this neighborhood. Uh, and then those images were used to Send to the Canadian uh, federal government and say, well, what's going on with these Canadian armed vehicles? It led to all this media coverage and trouble and headaches, I'm, I imagine, for both Saudi officials and then the Canadian uh, counterparts. Um, but but yeah, it's just really it's a matter of uh, being uh, vigilant and uh, being on top of the daily, you know, the day to day um, appearance of uh, the sort of the always already day to day appearance of weapons that, uh, in these conflicts, because as, as quickly as an, an image can appear, it can disappear. 
as quickly as an account that posts, uh, is consistently posting uh, images and, and uh, contextualizing uh, geographic areas, et cetera, it can be removed. You know, they've done that a lot uh, with what they call pro Houthi accounts, for example, in uh, Yemen. They've just erased them from YouTube, from Twitter. And fortunately, you know, for myself, I've archived a lot of these kinds of images because they're otherwise gone. Um, but, uh, you know, we take, we take the lead from some of these agencies like Bell and Cat who do really good, have done really good work of sort of spearheading and showing the way how to, how to, how to geolocate, how to, you know, how to cross-reference, how to reverse image search, all these sorts of methods are necessary nowadays if you want to stay on top of, uh, of these events. And then the other thing is on the data side, um, what was inter interesting is that, you know, we've had discussions over the years about uh, Statistics Canada data, you know, and understanding what codes correspond with what components or, or major or minor weapon systems. And I think that shed a lot of light. It's made it a lot easier to kind of track sort of with a couple of months lag, if you know, or what have you. Um, but it gives us a lot more uh, stability, I think, in our thinking about how to, how, to, uh, how to challenge the government and how to keep track of uh, these kinds of numbers. And uh, yeah, it's, it's ever evolving, like I said, and, uh, but, but it's a very important, I think, a, a aspect of, of our research today. Oh, Ken, please, yeah. Yeah, if I could just add to that. Um, I, my sense is that um, one of the aspects of the arms trade treaty that may not have been accounted for when it was being negotiated is the potential for monitoring the arms trade through social media and other kind of internet-based tools and along the lines of what Anthony has just mentioned. Um, I, my, my sense is civil society has a very important role to play in making sure the ATT uh, standards are met by all the, the state's parties through things like um, use of, uh, of, well, data generally through reports and so on, but also specifically kind of on the ground records of, of how weapons are being used and who has access to them and how they're diverted and so many other things that are part of the arms trade treaty. Um, when the arms trade treaty was first, uh, negotiations first started, uh, basically in, in, in 2004, um, none of this stuff was available. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we have a very different world uh, since, you know, since the treaty has come, come into force. And I would just, uh, because I see some Control Arms colleagues on the event today, give a shout out to their ATT monitor, uh, which is sort of the, the de facto civil society monitoring mechanism for ATT implementation. Yes, and a good plug. Um, thank you, Allison. And then perhaps very quickly, and then, and then we'll try and very quickly address maybe one or two questions. We are trying to wrap up by three, um, but uh, any, any kind of final thoughts on, you know, so so this deal, uh, this 2014 deal, is is the biggest deal in Canadian history, uh, far and away. Um, we're about as of last year, about halfway through the delivery of the materiel, the actual LAVs itself. Um, what's going to happen afterwards, right? Are we going to see the Canadian uh, arms trade continue to grow, or is it going to uh, retract and shrink? Is it going to continue on the the same way that it has? And then uh, as an addition to that, um, how can civil society, uh, you, you know, kind of critically analyze these trends? How can we ensure that governments such as Canada uh, keep on their obligations? And what are we seeing today, right? We've seen um, some really interesting grassroots and effective grassroots organizing in Canada, including in, in places like Hamilton. And we've also seen uh, resistance to the arms exports in the U.S. recently, places like Baltimore. So that that is certainly a double-barreled question, uh, at least. But uh, if anyone wants to take a quick shot, and then we can uh, try and address some of the Q and A. Um, I I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know exactly where things are going. Um, I think I think the arms trade, like the international arms trade is changing as, as war fighting and armed violence is changing. And there is a larger role for technology and for technology facilitated violence. And these are forward looking trends that I think we should uh, be aware of and keep in mind. Um, but I also, I, I feel really optimistic and positive about the civil society engagement within Canada against the Saudi deal. I know it's it's been going on for many years since the deal 
uh, first was negotiated. But I really feel that over the last little while, there's been two uh, pan-Canadian days of action in 2020. Uh, there have been several direct letters to Prime Minister Trudeau addressing this. Uh, there was the great grassroots action where they blocked the, the trucks, the transport trucks uh, just a few weeks ago. And I think it's really contributing to a broader interest in media and a broader sense of solidarity across the country and interested organizations working on this. I'll just add that the, the international dimension as well, you know, so these, these same, uh, so there was a protest a week ago or so in Baltimore, one of two protests that happened almost concurrently. Um, where they did see a dozen of the, the labs on the dock that were ready to be loaded. Um, but then when that, when that ship departs, they're, they're heading over to uh, Europe, a European port. And we've seen over the past few years, you know, you've seen uh, uh, longshoremen uh, refuse to load what they call, you know, hot cargo in, in ports like uh, Segundo, I believe, or Genoa uh, in Italy. And uh, this is really encouraging to see. It's, uh, I do wish there could be more deliberate sort of communication between you know, civil society in Canada and the US and then the European uh, countries that are affected by it. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it, it's, we've seen some momentum as, as it's encouraging to see in uh, whatever direction the, the arms trade uh, flows, so to speak, uh, in the future. Um, it's good that we'll have that base uh, you know, established for future struggles. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I, I'm going to, uh, again, just, just try to look at a couple questions in the Q&A. Uh, thank you everyone for being so active. Um, so one question that we've gotten a couple times uh, deals with the, the side of things where the, the Canadian Commercial Corporation, the CCC, which uh, aptly named as an arm of the government of Canada, is the ones who actually signed this contract. Um, and we've heard repeatedly that the government of Canada, you know, a lot of hand wringing, uh, saying, "Well, you know, essentially, it's a bad deal, but we can't get out." Uh, what do you guys make of that? Right? Uh, does that hold water? This this deal was signed in 2014. Uh, we've seen the deal. Uh, the term used was it was um, uh, I think renegotiated was the was the term GAC used last year. What do we make of this? Yeah, I mean, the, what is clear is, is that um, although we only have a, a, a minority of the facts associated with the original deal, what we do know is it's, it's got to be one of the worst deals in the history of Canada for how it binds the Canadian government and, and the general dynamics within Canada, um, uh, you know, in, to, to the advantage of the, of the Saudis. Now, it, uh, we, we have heard that it's been renegotiated. Again, we've seen no details. So we don't exactly know what that means. But um, uh, it's clear that, that that should never happen again. Um, and, uh, and I think even uh, the Canadian Commercial Corporation has recognized that. What is, of course, different since the, the contract was signed for the Canadian Commercial Corporation is the Arms Trade Treaty. As, a, as a, um, an agency of the Canadian government, they are also bound by the uh, obligations of the treaty. And, and um, based on some conversations we've had with CCC officials, they seem to be taking that seriously. So hopefully we won't see the same kind of uh, repeat of that kind of, uh, you know, basically absurd deal. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't closely monitor the activities of the Canadian Commercial Corporation because they're still the ones that are acting as a go-between uh, uh, in military trade and um, their role remains very important. And again, we have this, this relationship where the government of Canada under the CCC is actively going out and trying to broker arms deals when another arm of the government, Global Affairs Canada, is trying to assess the human rights dimensions, and they might have different findings, right? And to say that those findings could be awkward uh, is perhaps a little bit of an understatement. Uh, and I just want to note, I see tomorrow, thanks for bringing it up. I mean, one of the most absurd parts of the, the, this deal is, is you brought attention um, to some, uh, uh, it I, looks like I just, lost my Bluetooth. I, I'm not sure if you folks can still hear me, but uh, okay, good. 
Uh, you know, that, that Saudi Arabia uh, still is a couple billion dollars in arrears um, as of, uh, I think a few, or it was probably as of the beginning of the year. Um, and then one final question before we close out, um, is, is Canada, and, and this is, is kind of going off the back of, of our last question, or second last question, I suppose, is Canada currently looking to, to expand its markets? I mean, you know, uh, is organizations like the CCC, are they trying to diversify to move away from reliance on, on Saudi Arabia? Uh, the CCC used to, used to broker deals with over a dozen different countries in one calendar year, and now we only see a couple countries, the US and maybe one other. Is the, the government of Canada looking to diversify its consumer base? Is it looking to diversify what kind of weapons it sells? Uh, do we have any information on this or, or what does that look like? I would only mention again, real briefly, you know, the, the, the arms bazaar in, in the UAE is going on right now. Like that's kind of all systems are go, you know, proceeding a pace, of course, in, under the cloud of COVID uh, it, it's circumscribed and there's fewer, fewer Canadian companies that are participating there at the moment, but uh, I think what uh, co-founder of Project Plowshares, Ernie Regeer wrote in 1975 is still apt, and that's a, America's friends and customers must become Canada's friends and customers, and we're kind of bound up. Uh, we saw this last week, uh, uh, an order for uh, Bahraini uh, attack helicopters was placed, and you see a certain chunk of that is going towards an undisclosed Canadian company, um, and as Allison raised, you know, before, we, these are sorts of things we've got to keep our eye on and, and track and, um, um, and yeah, they, they, they're going to be frustrated by, uh, you know, the, uh, the dampening of, of global, uh, of arms sales in the Middle East that might come because of COVID and the effect on the economies and whatnot. But, so we might see a dip. Of course, there'll be a dip when the labs stop uh, being delivered, but um, make no mistake, the, they're, they're still in business and they're, they're still trying to uh, get, uh, get garner new orders, always. Yeah, and I, all I would add is I don't think Project Plowshare's job has ended uh, around uh, monitoring the arms trade. I think Canada will be here for involved for a while yet. Um, and uh, so keep up the work. All right, well, uh, if we don't have any further final words, uh, that does bring us uh, to uh, 61 minutes. So I believe we're going to close out. Um, I want to just quickly say thank you so much, uh, Allison, Ken, and, and Anthony. Um, you know, this was one heck of a panel, uh, and I'm really glad that we could uh, all gather here today. Um, thank you, everyone, all of our guests for joining. Thank you for um, not only your uh, interest in joining, there was, there, was, there was overwhelmingly a positive response, but also the, um, the very hot chat, which which I can see keeps going, but we just do not have the time to address everything. But um, we, we hope this isn't our last one. We plan to do more. So we'll make sure that everyone is, uh, is aware when we, uh, when we plan another one. So uh, on, on behalf of Project Plowshares, uh, thank you to the panelists and thank you for all of our participants.